thank you um, to the audience for tuning in today. Um, as stated by the um, title of my talk, I'm going to be talking about um, the extraction of plastics today and be introducing to you a new method that is rapid, simple, and efficient um, for this extraction. So just to give a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about here today is I'm first going to introduce you to this new method, which is um, the EDGE, and give you a little bit of background on that. And then we'll move into the applications where we'll talk about the extraction of some antioxidants and slip additives from polypropylene um, and polyethylene, and then conclude by talking about the extraction of phthalates from polyethylene and polyvinyl chloride. Um, so with that, um, let's talk a little bit about how you would traditionally do um, tra um, plastic extraction. And I don't know about you, but as I look at this slide and I see reflux and ultrasonic bath, I just think, wow, that looks dated. You know, um, and this is really what most people are doing today. I'm not trying to say there isn't some other techniques out there, but if you look at a lot of the approved methods and what people are doing, it really comes down to these techniques that have been around for a really long time, um, these techniques that are time-consuming, that use large amount of solvents, and are very manual um, in the process. So if we take a step back and just look at sample preparation as a whole, um, this pie graph that you're looking at here was taken from LCGC Magazine a few um, years ago. And um, I think it's staggering to see that 62% of our time was spent in sample preparation. Um, in the last few decades, we have made amazing improvements in the world of analysis. Um, in today's world of um, UPLC and triple quads and orbit traps and high resolution, um, it truly has been an exciting time frame in the analytical realm. Um, but sample preparation is really hasn't been um, you know, keeping up to speed with those advancements. Um, we need to be paying attention to everything on this pie graph, um, and particularly to sample preparation, and moving that into um, the modern world. Um, now, I have a couple techniques listed here, and by no means is this list exhaustive to the sample preparation techniques out there. Um, but there are um, some others to be considered, such as microwave extraction and pressurized fluid extraction. And then we've kind of already mentioned Soxlid and ultrasonic bath. Um, but the reality is all these techniques tend to still be time consuming, use large amounts of solvents, can be costly and really tedious in the preparation just to prepare the samples um, to begin with. Um, and as um, I've gone out and spoken to particularly some of our customers doing plastic extractions, there really seems to be no main consensus on what they're doing. Everybody seems to have a method that they've found that works for them, but they're not fully satisfied with it. There's really just no one widely accepted method that we're using for plastic extractions um, in today's world. Um, so what I hope um, as we talk through now me introducing you the edge is, is seeing that the edge overcomes these limitations and hopefully um, brings um, the world of um, plastics extraction, particularly for what we're talking about here today, um, modernizes it, um, does, you know, covers those aspects we're talking about. It makes it simple, makes it um, fast, and makes it more efficient. So what is the EDGE? The EDGE um, at the heart combines the processes of pressurized fluid extraction and dispersive solid phase extraction in um, one instrument. Now, traditionally, you probably wouldn't think either one of those techniques as really widely applicable to the extraction of plastics. So I don't want you to get caught up in that um, because the edge is so much more than that. But that's um, at the heart, this is what we're doing. Um, and some of those um, kind of maybe inherent concerns, if you think about pressurized fluid extraction and running plastics extractions where some of maybe the more um, other techniques out there would run into clogging issues, um, hopefully as I talk through um, this talk, you'll see that that isn't going to be a concern um, with the edge. Um, so what I want you to hopefully see by the end of this talk is that while maybe you wouldn't consider this type of technique for plastics, it might not be your first um, where your mind goes to is most applicable, really I think it is that answer to um, modernizing um, this world and giving you a really nice, um, simple, rapid, and efficient method for this extraction. 
with the edge, um, the simplicity really all comes down to our Q cup. Um, our Q cup is our sample holder. Um, it is just two simple pieces, and it's designed um, such that that bottom um, cap is um, cannot be cross-threaded. So you just simply twist it on. You can't mess it up, and, and, and you're good to go. Um, in between that bottom cap and the top of the cup is what we call our Q disk, and that's what's going to enable your filtration. Um, so, but. Really, for me, the beauty of the edge is the simplicity of this Q-cup um, and how easy it is to assemble um, your sample. In the matter of seconds, you literally can be, you know, your sample's prepared and then you're running and doing it, um, running your extraction. So um, it also, um, the Q-cup is extremely light, so you can place it directly on an analytical balance and weigh your sample into that Q-cup. So it truly is easy. So just lastly, before I move on to the applications, I want to show you a quick video of the Edge um, actually running. Um, I think that videos and visuals just really make it relatable, and you can understand in more detail what I'm talking about here. So as this video runs, I want you to keep in mind that this is real time. The Edge is running all these steps as fast as they're happening um, in this video, um, which is just really nice um, and fun to talk about that it truly is um, as quick as we're talking about. Um, so as I've already talked about that, um, the Q-Cup has been assembled with the Q-Disc and the sample has been placed in the cup. Our racks are nice and um, removable, so um, you could be preparing one rack while one is running, um, and then very easily just slide one rack in and slide the next in. Couple clicks and your sample is running. Um, I kind of talk that a lot of times as I'm talking through the edge running, that it takes me longer to explain what's going on than um, <laughs> it actually happens here. Um, so our Q cup now has been loaded into our chamber and um, our pressure seal comes down and creates a pressurized environment. So this is a cross section of our chamber showing what's going on. The solvent's gonna add from the bottom and the top. That bottom creates a um, solvent on the outside of the cup. But as we begin to heat here, that solvent on the outside is going to disperse up into the sample um, and creating what we call our dispersive effect, just aiding in the efficiency of the extraction. Um, in this video, once we reach temperature, we're going to drain. Um, for the plastics applications, we'll be talking a little bit about a hold time, so that's an option as well. Once you drain, you go through the cooling coil, um, so your hot extract is now at room temperature, so there's no concern of loss of low volatiles. Um, and then after, you have the option of what just happened was adding a rinse, so just clean solvent running through the sample one last time to make sure we get all of our analytes out of there. At this point, your extraction's done. You literally could be grabbing your vial and then moving on to the analysis portion of, um, you know, for your extract. Um, now, our system is a 12-place system in series, so it does, um, you do need to wash. So that's what's happening now is washing. Um, we are very um, careful with the washing and make sure that the entire flow path um, that saw your extract is going to be washed. Um, you can program up to five different um, washes, up to 30 mils per wash. So it's extremely versatile of what you're able to do on the wash. Once the wash is done, you're moving on to your next sample. It's simply that quick. Um, so um, another thing um, what um, Brittany's gonna do here is pull out the um, sample and show that it is just really bone dry. And that's another feel good feeling to me that we've not left anything left in that cell. We've got our entire extract and we're ready to go to analysis. So hopefully now what you've done is seen that I've introduced the edge to you, um, what it's capable of doing. But for the rest of the talk, um, you wanna see an application, you wanna see data, you wanna see really what this is capable of doing. And we're, like I said, we're gonna focus on plastics here. Um, so here is um, just a variety of different application fields in which the edge is applicable. But I think even more so, as we look at these pictures, we see plastics play a role in every one of these markets as well. Um, from food and our food packaging to personal care products and, um, you know, 
what's housing our products there, our shampoo, our toothpaste, um, what our drugs come in, um, the toys our children are playing with. Um, we interface with plastics just as consumers um, on a daily basis. So not only as scientists, but just as consumers, we should care about this field because plastics are part of our everyday life. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of you have a cell phone sitting somewhere nearby, and um, that cell phone probably has a case, and that case is probably made of plastic. Um, and then I don't know about you guys, but I sure handle my phone a lot during the day. Um, sadly to say, but this hour that I'm talking to you here today is probably the longest time stand I'm going to go today without touching my phone. Um, we um, touch plastics interface with them constantly. Um, so we should really care about the quality and the um, reliability and the safety of our plastics products. So that's why this talk is just really so important um, because this are, there's a need in our society. It's consumer driven at this point um, that we are um, providing good, reliable um, plastic materials. So with that, I want to take a step back to those traditional methods. So we already talked a little bit about the, you know, dated techniques of the reflux and the ultrasonic bath here. Um, but these are the methods um, that we're going to be referring to in this presentation. Um, we went back to two ASTM methods for the antioxidants and the slip additives. And um, the CPSC um, method is what we'll refer to when we're looking at the phthalates. Um, so I just wanted to um, make sure you had some background on the methods that we were referring to um, in comparison to the edge. So take just a little bit of a closer look at one of the ASTM methods here. Um, you'll see um, that you have the list of all the steps here. So for instance, this is just the reflux method. You would have to grind the sample. Then you would want to weigh that sample into a flask. You need to add a stir bar. You then add your solvent. You then um, boil for 90 minutes. You then cool the solution and then do a syringe filtration. And you know, I hope you see there, that's a very manual process. There's a lot um, going on um, that the technician, that whoever's running this experiment, has to do and pay attention to. There's a lot of room for human error. Um, and, you know, again, it's a lot of room for being modernized. Um, you know, it's a pretty um, old technique. Um, I think, um, you know, this is reflux, but it's very similar to um, Soxlet. And I think Soxlet has been around for well over 120 years at this point, and you know, I kind of like to say, you know, Soxlet's had its day. I don't want to take anything away from Soxlet, but um, it's just not modern, um, and um, we just have a room to um, really improve upon um, this process here. Now, we're going to now compare this to the edge. Now, the first two steps, grinding the sample, you still need to do that on the edge. I recommend that you still grind your sample, and you're still going to want to weigh your sample into the Q-cup. Um, so those are two things that you're still going to want to do. And then specifically for plastics, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation, you're probably going to want to do a syringe filtration as well. So while steps one, two, and three, and seven um, may remain the same, all those steps in between, the edge can take care of all of that, and you're not going to have to be worrying about it. It's going to happen automated, and your technician can be doing something else during that time and not be worried about um, the extraction process. So now, as um, we look at the steps of the edge, um, and again, I don't, I don't want to be too repetitive on the um, simple, rapid, and efficient, but if there's anything you take away from this presentation, that's what I want you to take away, is that's what we're offering you here. Um, and the um, setup is indeed simple, right? We already kind of went through the Q cup there. It's simple. And then the extraction, so we're not talking about 90 minutes of boiling anymore. Now we're talking 15 minutes, said and done, you can move over to analysis. We're going to use less solvent than the 50 mils. There's precise control of temperature, and I'm actually going to elaborate a little bit more on that in the next slide. And then it's efficient extraction, so it's automated. We've, we remove the human aspect here. Um, so we don't have to worry about that human error um, in this case, and so you just get a nice efficient extraction. So to elaborate more about the precise control of temperature, the edge is truly unique in the fact that it has a um, on the bottom an internal thermocouple, of, and then on the top of the cell an internal um, pressure sensor. So it 
any moment in time during the entire extraction process, we know exactly what the temperature is and what the pressure is. This gives us really precise control of what's going on. So in the world of plastics, pressure or temperature rather is really important because plastics melt at high temperatures. And what are we doing here? We're heating to high temperatures. And so we need to be concerned about not melting that plastic. And then we and so with the edge and having that control, that's simply not a concern. We're not going to be worried about that occurring in this case. Um, where some of the other pressurized fluid extraction um, systems out there, um, that is a concern. They don't have that price con control. And I typically what I hear is that clogging truly is a problem. And so what I want you to know with the edge is don't be worried about clogging. That's not going to happen because we're not going to have temperature issues. Um, we know exactly what is going on in the cell. Um, so not only is the clogging a concern um, regarding pressurized fluid extraction, but even if we talk about sock slit, um, that can easily have heating issues as well. So what I've got pictured, what I've got pictured here is um, the fact that um, this is socks that run in our lab. Um, so we're taking directly a picture out of our lab that happened to us um, as we were running these experiments. So this happens um, that overheated, you know? So, you know, kind of with socks, you kind of have to babysit a little bit. You got to, you know, make sure everything's set up just right. Um, it's a lot of, you know, manual work. You don't have to babysit the edge. Um, you're going to be confident that when you set that up, it's going to run and you're going to have no concerns. Um, so it's just nice to know that um, exceeding temperature is not something that you need to be worried about. So as I mentioned when I talked about the different applications that we were going to be talking about, um, we're going to focus on antioxidants and slip additives, and then I'll conclude with talking about phthalates. So to focus a little bit more on antioxidants and slip additives, um, why, why do we care? Um, well, we, we care about these guys because um, they're primarily found in our food packaging and our medical supplies. Um, so again, products that we're interfacing on a daily basis, primarily these components are used for as stabilizers for performance. Um, and we care about the quality of our product. Um, if we talk specifically about a medical supply, such as a hip replacement, you want to make sure that's a good quality product. I mean, that's being implanted in, you know, in your body. Um, that's something you care about, that there's quality there. Um, the concern from a safety perspective is that um, do these components migrate out? Are they migrating out of the plastic containers into our food? Uh, are they migrating out into our water? Are they migrating out into our bodies? Um, so this is something that we do um, certainly care about from both a performance um, and quality issue, but also from a safety concern as well. Um, and then again, I love pictures. I think they're relatable. Um, they relate back to all of us. And as I look at these pictures, I realize that as I walk into the grocery store, there's not a section of that grocery store that I can walk into in which I'm not seeing these types of materials. Um, so they truly are interfacing with us on a daily basis. Um, so we want to, as consumers, want to make sure that our products are good. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the edge. Let's talk about some of the parameters and the methods that we're running. So I'm going to talk by talking about the um, method we specifically use for the extraction of the antioxidants and slip additives from polypropylene. Um, and what I've got here again pictured is the cross section of our Q-cup. So you can kind of visualize where these parameters are taking place and how they're working. Um, so for this particular method, we used 30 mils as our top volume add of isopropanol. So isopropanol was our extraction solvent in this case. We are heating to both 80 and 120 degrees for these samples. And as I talk through the data, I'll explain why um, we ran at both of those temperatures. And then um, we're going to add our bottom add. It's just pretty defaulted to our 10 mil bottom adds. That's an option, by the way. You don't have to do a bottom add. Um, but in a lot, most of our methods, you'll see a default of a 10 mil bottom add. Um, for our sample size here, we're going to do a one gram. Um, and then um, our Q-disc. I haven't talked too much about Q-discs up to this point. Um, I just simply said that they um, do our filtration. 
but I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about the um, QDISC that we have available um, for the edge. So we have our M line of QDISC, which are membranes, um, a couple different materials we have, and they are all sub one micron um, porosity. We also have a glass fiber Q-disc, which is also sub one micron. And then we have our line of cellulose Q-disc, so those are all our C-discs, um, that um, range in porosity from 2.5 microns up to 40 microns. So we have a wide variety of different Q-disc um, options. Um, so really, whatever application um, you're doing, we should have something that is going to be um, right for your sample matrix. Um, a lot of the decision making comes down to what type of analysis are you doing? What type of filtration do you need to protect your UPLC or your GC? That's really why um, we're going to want to filter in this case. So for these particular um, extractions for the antioxidants and slip additives, we want to, um, we're going to do um, HPLC analysis. So we're going to do a, one of our M filters here. And then you say, see that I have, um, that we use the C9 as well. And um, what we found is that um, that C9 kind of works as a support. It's just an extra layer of protection, um, generally. Um, so for some of the more difficult samples, and I would certainly um, throw plastics as, as a challenging sample in general for no matter what technique you're running into, um, you may want to just ensure that you're going to have a nice robust Q-disc, that it's going to seal well in your Q-cup, and that C9 Q-disc is just going to help ensure that. Um, so that just adds an extra layer of protection there. Um, then to talk a little bit more about the other parameters, we are going to do a hold time with the plastics. And um, you can kind of imagine that when you're extracting a plastic sample, you want it to give it enough time so that it swells and kind of changes a little bit so that you can actually access that plastic and have a good extraction. So the whole time is key here. You do need to implement in that whole time so that you get an efficient extraction. And then I talked about um, the washing as you were watching the video and the fact that you can run up to five different washes at a max of 30 mils per wash. Um, so you have a lot of versatility. But our default washing suggestions would be running two wash cycles of your extract solvent, which is what you see here. And typically that is simple enough unless you're running really hot analytes to get good um, washing and no concern of carryover. So this is our method for polypropylene. And if we look now at our method for polyethylene, um, you'll see that we really didn't make a lot of changes. Um, only the thing that changed in this particular case is the temperature. And so I want to talk a little bit more about temperature. We kind of have already, as we were talking about, the edge um, is really unique in our precise temperature control. But temperature is key because you want to make sure that you're not going too hot that melting becomes a problem. Um, so really, um, upon changing a different plastic, the first parameter you want to consider is, is my temperature now applicable um, for that plastic? And so with every difference in change of um, plastic material, you really want to make sure the temperature um, matches in turn. Um, so in this case, we were doing most of the method development for the polypropylene. And so we kept the same method. We just made sure the temperature was um, adapted accordingly and then ran the polyethylene. As I talk about the um, polyethylene data, um, we'll talk about how there's maybe some room of improvement as far as method development is concerned, where we could specifically hone in this method, particularly for polyethylene. So keep in mind that we use the same pretty much the same method here for these two plastics, um, where the edge really lends itself to being able to method develop for any specific um, material that you're running. And, and it's, it's so quick that you, um, you know, for instance, you know, even with a 15 minute hold time, um, and then say you're doing about a 20 minute analysis, um, in well less than an hour, you've got information back. Um, and so you can be tweaking that method and making sure that you've got everything set just right. So again, pictures. I love pictures. You're going to see a lot of pictures. I'm a big fan of them. Um, and um, so this is just kind of just talking through how simple this process really is. Um, so we just looked at the method. So now, um, in this case, you would drop in your M1 Q-disc for this particular um, polypropylene sample. And then we'd put another um, Q-disc with C9 on top of that. We'd then um, screw on the bottom of our cup. Um, we put our Q cup onto the analytical balance and weigh in our one gram of um, polypropylene. 
we would then drop that into our rack on the edge and hit play. Um, and so, and then you're done. 15 minutes later, you're going to have your extract that's ready to go for analysis. So I do want to note um, that during the process, um, and this is very solvent dependent, but you may see some evaporation. And um, to account for that evaporation, you need to dilute up to a known volume. Um, so you need to know what your volume recovery is in the end. Um, whether you um, take your um, extract and pour it into a graduated cylinder to know exactly what your volume is, that would work, but that's probably a lot of extra effort. We offer here at TEM um, certified graduated vials, which are pictured here. Um, so those, that really makes it quite simple. Um, so all you need to do is dilute up to that known volume, and then you can go direct to analysis. Now, depending on the analytical equipment that um, you have um, and the sensitivity of that equipment, you may need to concentrate down to a known volume, okay? So that's going to depend on your workflow and what type of concentration you want to be um, injecting at. So, but regardless, whether you're concentrating down to a known volume or diluting up to a known volume, you need to know what your volume is at the end. So I felt that's just an important step to mention. So um, here is our analytical method that we used, and there's a picture of our actual unit. Um, so that is our water security H-class system. Um, we have a Zevo TQD um, triple quad mass spec, um, but in this case we are using our PDA detector, which is sitting right on top of that mass spec. Um, and we um, were referring back to the ASTM method. Um, so in this case, while our system is capable of UPLC analysis, we ran an HPLC method. Um, we did a 10 microliter injection. Our, temp our column heater was set at 50 degrees C, and we did a very standard gradient from water to acetonitrile. Um, I really like to put the analytical methods up there because while we're talking about extraction here and on the sample preparation side of things, you have to qualify your, your extraction with analysis. So I want you guys to, to be prepared to run the entire process from start to finish and be able to um, reproduce this data. So if we look at the actual um, compounds that we were looking at here, you see um, some of the primary and secondary antioxidants as well as the slip additive there. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about some of the, um, what I find interesting about some of these components, um, the BHT is a suspect um, carcinogen right now. So just from a safety component, um, we're going to care about um, the BHT and um, that, that presence. Um, then um, from kind of more of an interesting perspective as I was reading about these analytes um, that I didn't know about is that vitamin E is added to um, our um, medical implants. So your hip implant, um, they're incorporating some vitamin E in there that really helps with the um, wearability of that implant. Um, and you can see definitely um, as a joint or that that's really important. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And then um, the Ergonox um, 1076 um, has been found that it actually migrates more in the presence of fat. Um, and so that's kind of interesting, too, because you imagine if that component was present in the material um, in fatty food stuff, um, that would be something you might be, um, want to be aware of and look into. Um, so all of these components are playing um, specific roles, um, and um, like I mentioned before, the migration of these components into the materials that are in the packaging is really um, what we want to look at here. And then also just how much is present so that you know what the concoction of your plastic material really is as well from a um, just stability point of view as well. So here's the chromatogram, and again, I just want to keep us honest, make sure we're showing good chromatography so that um, we got good separation across the board um, for all the analytes of um, interest. Um, and just um, quickly um, was going to mention that the ergophos um, does undergo oxidation. So um, there's two peaks for that. We're going to look at the um, phosphite as well as the ergophos there, and then we'll combine those to look at a total um, percentage for that particular component. But we get nice separation for all the different components that we're looking at here. So more pictures. Like I said, I, I love pictures. Um, so, and I think that you can learn so much by what your extracts look like. 
um, it's amazing, you know, as you continue to do this process, just how much a visual really does tell you and how the process went. So this is um, polypropylene and um, the pictures of pre-extraction and then post-extraction. And it's subtle here, okay? I'm not trying to say there's dramatic change here. And um, I don't know if it's this time of year with the holidays and me being excited about possibly seeing snow, but I kind of see a kind of ice to snow transformation here. If I look at the pre-extraction, it looks a little bit more crystalline, a little bit glossier, a um, little bit more like ice. And then if I look at the post-extracted polypropylene, um, it looks um, a little bit more matte, a little bit dull, and a little bit fluffier, a little bit more like snow. Um, so I'm going to run with that analogy. I don't know if you guys see the same things, but what I do want you to see is that you want to see some sort of transformation. It doesn't have to be dramatic. I, you know, we don't want to see this solidified um, mass that implying that everything just melted. Okay? We don't want to go that far, but we want to walk that fine line of we see some sort of transformation. If you um, extracted the sample and it looked exactly the same post-extraction, you probably didn't get a great extraction. Um, so you do want to see some change here, and so that's what I want to say is that definitely it's subtle, but we do see a change in that material from um, the extraction process. So this is the actual matrix. Let's take a look at the extracts themselves. Um, now, here we can kind of talk about a couple of the different factors you have control over. Um, we can control solvent volume. We can control the solvent itself. We can control um, the temperature, hold time, and the edge actually has options of cycles as well. Um, and so if you look at those two extracts, you see one that's clear and one that's cloudy, and there's a volume difference there too, but I'm going to focus on the clear versus cloudy here. And um, you might think, oh, the cloudy one, that's not the good extract, um, but that's not the truth here. Um, with these extracts, we actually got a better percent recovery um, for the sample in which you see that cloudiness there. And so I like to put this here just so you know that that's to be expected with these plastics. Now, do not be concerned that that's going to cause any issues with the extraction. It's not going to cause any clogging issues. Everything's going to be just fine on that. It doesn't cause any carryover issues. But there is going to be, um, most likely, a sort of precipitation. So for these plastic samples, while we did just filter at 0.22 microns to collect this um, extract, I would recommend a syringe filtration prior to analysis just to simply protect your analytical equipment if you do indeed um, see um, the precipitate in there. Now, you know, I don't know what your quality factor is of how much you need to see. Maybe you can run at the lower temperature because um, we do, you know, get decent recovery there as well. But the recovery is better um, for the sample in which you see that precipitate. And this is normal. So here is just the soxalate extracted polypropylene, and you also see that snow globe effect. You see that precipitate in there as well. So really, regardless of the technique you're running, um, you tend to see this precipitate. And the truth is, there's a lot in these plastics. So as we are extracting um, the components of interest, we're extracting a lot of other stuff as well. Um, so um, just don't be, don't be afraid by seeing a little bit of precipitation. That is to be expected. If we look at the extracted polyethylene here, it's very subtle, but there's some slight differences from the polypropylene, more in the fact that the polypropylene was more dispersed after extraction, and the polyethylene tends to pack a little bit more after extraction. But I still see that same ice-to-snow-like situation. It goes kind of glossy to matte, kind of more crystalline to more fluffy. Um, so we're still seeing that change that we want to see. And if we look at the um, extracted samples, we um, see the same thing. So in this case, this sample has settled. So you do see that, that um, the precipitate does settle to the bottom there. But again, I would recommend a syringe filtration prior to analysis. Same case, um, the higher temperature here um, led to more precipitation, but also led to um, a better percent recovery. So, finished with my pictures for a little bit here for these um, particular samples, and let's talk about actual numbers. Let's talk about the data. 
Um, so for the um, antioxidants and slip additives in polypropylene, we ran at 80 degrees C and at 120 degrees C. Um, for the BHT component, um, it is known to be um, temperature um, have um, temperature stability issues. It actually starts to degrade at 120 degrees C. Um, so our numbers are kind of all over the place um, for the 120 degrees C. And to get good data, um, we really needed to be at that lower temperature for the BHT. Um, now, I will say that the ASTM method says that BHT might be applicable um, to this method, but it does not confirm um, that it is. Um, so I was, and we're happy to see that we're able to extract the BHT, um, but this is a known, um, really difficult um, component to work with. It's actually also known to degrade um, HPLC columns. Um, it's and, and it's really difficult to analyze. Um, so for that particular component, if that's the one of interest, we would suggest a lower temperature um, to look at that. Um, now, if we look at the arucamide here, um, it was kind of the opposite scenario in the fact that we got better extraction efficiency at a higher temperature. Now, this component as well is also um, challenging to work with. Um, it, is, um, you, it tends to get lost during the grinding um, process, um, so that's always a concern um, for this um, slip additive. And, and as well is it doesn't have a um, UV max, which so we're doing UV um, detection here, in the um, range that we're looking at. Um, so it requires a lot of multiple injections of the internal standard. Um, so it's just another component that um, is a little bit more challenging to work with. Um, so in this case, if that was the component you were specifically looked at, we'd recommend um, running at 120 degrees C. But for the rest of the components, we get good recovery and good RSD values really regardless of the temperature at 80 or 120. So it would be up to your preference on what to run and what you were looking at here. If we compare our data to the ASTM um, method, we, across the board, for every analyte, get better percent recovery for the edge than we did with the ASTM method. Furthermore, if we move on to looking at polypropylene, um, we see the same story. Okay? We're able to get better extraction efficiency um, on the edge than we were with the ASTM method. Now, let me make a note here. Um, as we talked about the methods, um, we sh showed that we kind of just used the same method for the polyethylene as we had for the polypropylene. I really feel that we could really take into consideration some of those other factors such as um, solvent and hold time and um, method develop the polyethylene method even better than what we're looking at here. But regardless, we're still better than the ASTM method here. Um, I just think that there's even more room for improvement in method development down the road. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next application of the phthalates, but I just wanted to kind of take a moment here at kind of this stage and say that I hope what you've seen so far is that the EDGE truly is a rapid, simple, and efficient method um, for these extractions, and hopefully I'll continue to make that point as we talk about the phthalates. Now, the phthalates are, um, again, as consumers, as just people um, really kind of something we need to be aware of. Um, these are materials that are used to soften plastics. They are known um, dangerous chemical toxins. Um, and then even, I think, even more scary is that they're continuously released into the environment. And these components are persistent. So they're kind of always around. And so it's something we really want to make sure that we're minimizing. Um, and if we look at these pictures here, um, I don't know about you, but I look at that rubber ducky and I think of my four-year-old um, daughter who loves rubber duckies when she's taken a bath and that, you know, certainly not many years ago she was putting that in her mouth and potentially getting that exposure. And so, um, you know, if we look at these toys, um, we see some um, pet um, toys as well there, you know, these are what our children and our pets are interfacing with, and, and certainly um, we care about the safety of our children and our pets. Um, so it's just something, you know, just as people that we care about. Um, but as chemists as well, we want to make sure we're doing good chemistry and we're able to extract these components um, and in a lot of cases um, make sure that they are not present anymore. 
Um, so if we look at our EDGE method here for phthalates in polyethylene, um, you're actually going to see some, some differences from what the methods we were running with um, for the um, flip additives and antioxidants. And um, the first is you're going to see that we use a different um, solvent um, combination here. And then typically, um, I'll make a note that with plastics, um, you do run um, two type, two solvents. Typically, you're going to want to run one solvent that's going to swell the plastic and then another solvent that's going to do the extraction. So seeing a dual solvent combination for a plastic extraction is very, very common. Um, so we're using that here. Again, your temperature is going to be related to the plastic that you're running. Um, we're still going to run a one gram sample here. And because we're doing GCMS analysis here, we're going to use a C1 um, Q-disc. In this particular method, we're using a 10-minute hold time, and we're going to use a default um, washing parameters here. So if we look at the method for the um, polyvinyl chloride, um, we're going to, again, change that solvent. So we're going to use an applicable solvent um, combination for this particular plastic. And also, we're going to adapt that temperature to reflect the plastic um, that we're running. Um, so these are just, you know, always when you're looking at the plastics, first thing you want to be aware of is that um, you have the right temperature. And then you want to make sure you're running the right solvents for um, the analytes you're looking for, and that you're running a significantly long hold time such that you get a good extraction. Those are kind of the key success to method development for the plastics. If we look at the GCMS method here, again, you see a picture of our system in our lab that we ran this data on. Um, we have an Agilent GCMS. In this case, we used a Phenomen X column. Um, our inlet temperature was about 250 degrees C, uh, 0.8 mil per minute flow rate of helium, and a very standard um, gradient of um, um, temperature gradient for our um, system. We base all this method off of um, EPA 8270, um, which is semi-volatile organic compounds that the phthalates fall under. Um, so that's kind of what this method was based off of. And in this case, we are using our mass spec and doing um, single iron, iron monitoring mode to do our quantification. If we look at the chromatogram, again, good separation across the board, um, which is definitely what we want to see. Um, so no interferences or anything. We're able to see all our phthalates of interest. If we look at the pictures, um, I'm going with the same story, snow to ice. Um, that's what these plastics tend to do. Um, and in this case, we ran a CRM um, that we purchased from Spec Serta Prep. Um, and it's a little bit finer. So, so definitely um, this is grounded to a finer powder. Um, and I do want to talk just a second about um, grinding because it's important. Um, the more surface area you have um, in your plastic, the better extraction efficiency you will have. Um, so that is so, so certainly something that you want to look at. Now, I'm not saying you can't extract pellets because you can. You can put pellets in here. Um, it's just that the, you know, it's kind of logical. The more surface area you have that plastic, the better chance you have of a better extraction. Um, so we'd recommend grinding as it's recommended in the ASTM method as well. If we look at the polyvinyl chloride, again, this is a CRM. And again, very similar, this kind of ice to snow effect. And in this case, the polyvinyl chloride packed in more than that polyethylene um, packed in. If we look at the data here, um, we see nice recovery in RSD values um, for all these components. Um, and um, again, you know, these phthalates, they've been known as chemical toxins. Um, they also, like I said, they're persistent. Um, they're also very absorbent, um, almost 100% absorption into your body if you um, had any oral or inhalation um, to these um, types of um, compounds. Um, so there are certainly things we want to um, be avoiding and making sure they're not present. If we look at the PVC data, and this is probably the most applicable. Um, most of these toys that we care about um, that are, you know, our children are playing with um, are made of PVC. Um, and so in the PVC, we are also able to get good extraction efficiency and RSD values. And I want to note that all data up to this point has been absolute recovery data. Um, so that is what we're um, looking at here. Um, so. That brings me to um, my conclusion of my talk. Um, what I hope I've showed you is that um, we achieved good recoveries in RSD values for the antioxidants and slip additives 
in the polypropylene and polyethylene, as well as the phthalates in the polyethylenes and the polyvinyl chloride. But beyond just these analytes and these plastics, I hope you realize the EDGE is a rapid, simple, and efficient method for all extraction of plastics. And so no matter what additive you're looking at um, or what plastic you're looking at, um, I think you should be considering the EDGE. Um, I think that's the technique that's going to um, modernize the sample preparation world and making that um, much um, simpler and more efficient for us moving forward.